Hello, I'm George Liston CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. It's now called the International City, but most people probably still think of it as the Green Zone, the fortified enclave in the heart of Baghdad that served as the command post of the Coalition Provisional Authority. The walls of the Green Zone are massive and 17 feet high. While their practical effect is to preclude attack, their symbolic value may lie in the dubious policy decisions made during the post-invasion period, when the Coalition Provisional Authority oversaw the American occupation of Iraq. That period and those decisions are grippingly detailed in a new book, Imperial Life in the Emerald City, by Rajiv Chandra Sekharan. Rajiv, welcome to Dialogue. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you. It is a pleasure to have you here, Rajiv. And let me hold up your fine book the right way so that everyone can see it and I would hope uh, read it as I have done and enjoy it and learn from it. Uh, and in learning from it, Rajiv, let me begin with uh, kind of the first lesson that I took, and that's the place itself. The Emerald City, the Green Zone, it's a, it's a very surrealistic sort of uh, setting down in the middle of Baghdad of what seems almost like an American suburb. I mean, there, the descriptions are throughout the book in these vignettes, uh, and one gets this, uh, as I say, surrealistic impression of designer sunglasses and SUVs being ubiquitous. Was there a problem in that? The, the very organization of the place? M most certainly. I mean, it was a metaphor for the American disconnect. Mm -hmm. uh, the disconnect between the well-meaning civilians who mm -hmm. went there with the mandate of governing and reconstructing Iraq and the country that they were really supposed to be working in, mm -hmm. uh, instead of really being out and about, being able to interact with Iraqis, they set themselves up mm -hmm. in this green zone, right. in this enclave. Now, you know, it's understandable that they'd have to have a headquarters, it would have to have some security, mm -hmm. but what happened was, was that it, it really sort of grew to, mm -hmm. to, to, to almost unreal proportions right. and, uh, you know, the walls got higher and, and inside it began to turn into a little America. We should point out at this point that all the while the green zone is uh, adopting this character, you're living in what uh, you and your fellow journalists referred to as the Red Zone. You were a Washington Post reporter and then you became bureau chief for the Washington Post in Baghdad. So do you think that there was a period, uh, Rajiv, even with security concerns, when they could have run this thing differently? I, I most certainly do. I think in those early months mm -hmm. uh, when, and it's hard to imagine now, mm -hmm. but in, in the first few months after the fall of Saddam's government, uh, there was a lot of uh, public support for the American presence, right. uh, that, that the security threat was, was not nearly what it is today. Uh, and American civilians and military personnel could really drive through the city without too much fear of attack. Mm -hmm. And instead of really taking advantage of that, there were a number of people who really cloistered themselves in this uh, surreal green zone. And so while I was living on the outside in a world that was maybe getting eight, ten hours of electricity a day, where there weren't police on the streets, where there were paralyzing traffic jams, uh, where it was fairly dysfunctional. On the inside, as I write in the book, sort of the calm sterility of an American subdivision right. prevailed. You, you couldn't hear the honking horns. You couldn't hear the Mosin's call to prayer. Mm -hmm. Halliburton brought in scores of brand new Chevy Suburbans. People drove around right. in them. There were bars and mm -hmm. discos. They, they served, and get this, they served bacon uh, at almost every meal. And, you know, and a great here, deal of alcohol. Yes, but mm -hmm. and, and here in the heart of a Muslim country, mm -hmm. and Muslims, many Muslims find pork products to be offensive and, and certainly alcohol. Right. Um, and in that dining hall, you know, there was bacon for breakfast, hot dogs for lunch, and, mm -hmm. and, and Iraqis who worked there eventually complained about this. And, yeah. and, and those Iraqis were, quite, were, were few, weren't they? I mean, there, were, there, there wasn't a large Iraqi workforce in, inside the Green Zone. It wasn't huge, but there were some who were there as translators, as janitors, as support personnel. And, and they eventually raised this as, as a complaint. And it was brushed off by Halliburton managers mm -hmm. who, who deemed that cultural sensitivity really took a back seat to, to troop morale, or, or at least the morale of the civilians right. in there. They wanted to give them good down-home comfort food. And, and to me, this was really indicative of, of the tone deafness, of yeah. the, the inability to connect with the people that the CPA was supposed to be working with. Let me pick up on that theme of tone deafness, because I think that is a consistent theme throughout the book, and it certainly is reflected in your very critical analysis of the policies that get developed in this kind of setting. And uh, a lot 
can be said on this, but in the interest of brevity, let me just suggest this theme that I, I felt, uh, Rajiv, that um, with this disconnect from the reality, there was kind of a preset agenda within the CPA of pursuing democratization and capitalism at, at full tilt. You know, this was what we were going to do, no matter what, uh, to create a kind of a secular, federal, capitalist society no matter what was outside those walls. Exactly, and it was going to be this sort of big bang approach. We're going to do it all right away. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to privatize Iraq's state-owned enterprises in 30 days. We're going to uh, require the Iraqis to, to draft a constitution, to have a referendum on it, and have general elections before we'll hand over sovereignty. Uh, it was a, a whole host of incredibly ambitious initiatives that I don't believe were commensurate with the resources on the ground, with troop levels, with reconstruction, assets mm -hmm. a and the feeling I got, and, and it's certainly a theme that I strike in this book, is that uh, many in the coalition provisional authority, starting with Ambassador Bremer on down, really tried to bite off more than they could chew. Right. And, and that biting off more than they could chew, and again, another very interesting uh, evocative phrase, because that's the kind of thing that, quote, true believers will do, just out of kind of a fanatic zeal for the... And we get the sense throughout this book of true believers, people committed to an ideology rather than mm -hmm. a reality as being the backbone of the CPA. Indeed, you know, a lot of people with uh, experience in the Arab world, with uh, uh, knowledge of, of the Arabic language, with post-conflict reconstruction experience, were, were systematically excluded from participating in the coalition provisional authority in the process of rebuilding Iraq. Because As opposed they, to whom? Who was Because chosen? they were viewed by various people in the Bush administration as insufficiently committed to, the, to this notion of democratizing the Middle East. They were seen mm -hmm. as people with old thinking, old ways. Instead, they wanted young, true believers. And people were, were recruited to work there from Republican offices on Capitol Hill, from uh, other parts of the Bush administration, from conservative think tanks in, in Washington, D.C. And the result was you got a lot of people who were, who were very loyal, but, but really lacked, in some cases, right. subject matter expertise. The uh, poster child for this, and I don't want to be unfair to any individual, because yep. these are also very well um, thinking person, mm -hmm. young people, but uh, there's a 24-year-old who gets put in charge of the Security and Exchange Commission, rebuilding it in Iraq, at, without any prior experience at all. That's right. And he's a good young kid, mm -hmm. a smart, smart guy, mm -hmm. um, but was thrust into a job that he, he really didn't have a background for. Right. He had never worked on Wall Street. He didn't have a finance background, yet he had applied for a job at the White House. Mm -hmm. He was known to some people who were doing personnel recruitment. He was sent out there. Yeah. Another particularly galling example to me was in the world of health care. Um, th there was an individual by the name of Skip Burkle who was the, the first person assigned to, to rebuild the health care system. And he had worked at the U.S. Agency for International Development. He was a physician. He had four postgraduate degrees. He taught public health. Mm -hmm. uh, he was described by his colleagues as the single most talented post-conflict public health specialist in the United States. Uh, he'd worked in, in Haiti, in Kosovo, and in uh, northern Iraq after the 91 Gulf War. Two weeks into it, he was yanked from Iraq. And he right. was told by a senior official at USAID that the White House wanted a quote-unquote loyalist in the job. Yeah. As I write in the book, this man had a wall full of degrees, but he didn't have a picture with the president. <laughs> There's some other aspects of this, too. I mean, along with the inexperienced people put in uh, positions of uh, awesome responsibility, to use a phrase, uh, you get some kind of bizarre reasoning. For example, uh, privatization, as I said before, is linked with democratization. In, in other words, you're not going to get one without the other in this view. But, and this I found even as a non-economist economist, rather striking, at one point there's a decision that we're going to have privatization through shrinkage. I mean, you've got, the, you got this very surrealistic accounting process in Iraqi industries, most of them government run. Uh, the figures don't, meet, don't add up. Uh, the factories are, are broken down. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to let them fail. And that's somehow going to attract investors. Yes. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you look at it today. I mean, there was even a view among some economists who were working there mm -hmm. that the looting was a good thing because it was putting uh, public assets in private hands, and that would eventually oh, be more so. efficient. And, you know, so, you know, well, how is a looting of, of public buses a good thing at the end of the day? It's not like these, these freelance bus drivers are yeah. actually, you know, driving the routes they're supposed to be doing. But, you know, instead of at least trying to, to rebuild these factories, you know, with the goal of selling it, I'm not arguing that government-owned industries make sense mm -hmm. over the long term, but what you, what you have to do, a good analogy here is a broken-down old house. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a, a 
a, a, a broken factory, you need to repair it, get the people back working. Then you fetch a higher price when you sell it instead of just saying, well, we're going to try to sell off this, mm -hmm. this uh, dilapidated building uh, in one fell swoop. I think, well, I think that's a, there's a very good point. And your use of the word looting reminds me of something. It's, it's, it's the base of what you and I are talking about right now, that all the while this kind of, um, well, to give it uh, its, you know, its due, this, this sort of uh, deep commitment to these, these grand principles is being undertaken in the CPA. The outside, the people beyond the walls, they want an end to the looting. They want security, they want basic services, and they want employment. In other words, the basics have been entirely, or at least largely, ignored. Exactly. They wanted security first and foremost, mm -hmm. and as you point out here, they wanted basic services. Mm -hmm. And instead, the people cloistered in the green zone were thinking about sort of the changes you'd make in an ideal world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people weren't considered, a, you know, didn't care about privatization. They wanted to get back to work. Mm -hmm. They wanted jobs. I mean, here you have a country with 40 percent unemployment. Right. What did some of the economists in the palace uh, advocate and what did they eventually enact? A flat tax. Mm -hmm. you know, who needs tax code reform mm -hmm. when you've got 40 percent unemployment? You need to be thinking about a New Deal like jobs program. Right. Get people working, you know, cleaning up the streets, removing rubble, mm -hmm. rebuilding government buildings. And all of that seemed to take a back seat to these, these very sort of fanciful uh, neoconservative ideas. Right. In some senses, they viewed the country as this kind of quiescent terrarium for mm -hmm. a lot of ideas that really even haven't gained traction in this country. That's, that's, uh, I think that that's very apt. Um, the um, uh, person at the top of this pyramid, if you will, of decision making in the, in the green zone is described in the book, characterized in the book as the viceroy. And this, of course, is L. Paul Jerry Bremer. And um, I'd like to talk with you a bit about him. There's a very interesting character development, if I can use that phrase, uh, the reader detects, at least this one did, uh, throughout this book. When you first meet with him, Rajiv, and you interview him, I think you're deeply impressed with his zeal, with his, even with his, his idealism and his vision. He's a highly intelligent man, hardworking, but quite frankly, and this is my opinion, he seems to get increasingly autocratic in the course of developments there, and his view of what's possible becomes, uh, I thought, confined by a kind of tunnel vision. Please. You've read the book very carefully and you've just nailed it because that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. You know, in the very beginning, I, I really had a lot of hope and confidence in Bremer. I wasn't one of these people who thought mm -hmm. from the get-go he was the wrong man for the job mm -hmm. or his ideas were bad. The problem is, is that he became a product of this green zone. Mm -hmm. You know, he started to, to surround himself with a small group of advisors. His ability to interact with Iraqis was, was restricted. And his ambitions grew, and his ambitions uh, there in the green zone mm -hmm. really became disconnected from the reality on the ground. You know, if he had had many tens of thousands of more troops in the country stabilizing things, if the Iraqis had wanted a full-on occupation, if there were billions of dollars in reconstruction resources at the ready immediately, mm -hmm. then perhaps some of this could have worked, some of his agenda. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have those resources, and he didn't have that sort of mandate, at least not from the Iraqi people. Right. And, and, and as a result, that was the fundamental disconnect. And so here you had sort of lofty plans being built up, and really no support, no buy-in, no resources. And it all, as I, as I write in the book, sort of starts to come crashing down by the right. fall of 2003. And ultimately, there is this very hasty effort to kind of rewrite all of the plans and this, this effort to then quickly get out of right, there as exactly. fast as possible. Yeah, there is, it, there's a very clear point uh, toward the end of this book where that transition becomes the all-important priority. Let's get the hell out, get this thing done, and, and make it happen. It's a huge shift because yeah. for the first many months, it's let's be ambitious, we're staying here for a while, let's try to rebuild everything. Mm -hmm. Iraq, you know, in many ways, you, know, you think of an analogy as a broken down old car. Mm -hmm. You know, what the Iraqis wanted is somebody to come in, change the spark plugs, pour some engine oil on it and get it going and make repairs yeah. on the way. Bremer's approach was let's put it on the blocks, mm -hmm. let's take the engine out, let's build it, rebuild it bolt by bolt and give them, you know, a brand new car. Mm -hmm. And the Iraqis didn't want that. And, and at that turning point, right. that's when they said, all right, look, we're just going to, you know, whatever car you can, mm -hmm. let's get going. Speaking of the Iraqis and speaking of turning points and uh, the kind of transition or non-occupation they might have desired, I also got the impression that uh, Jerry Bremer and others, many others, may never have fully appreciated the, the power, the, the influence of uh, Ayatollah Ali uh, Sistani to begin with. 
That's right. And he, uh, he, as we now know today, is one of the most, if not the, the most influential mm -hmm. figures in Iraqi society, mm -hmm. a man of unparalleled influence. Um, but in those early days, there was this view in the palace, oh, you know, he's just sort of an old man with a turban, mm -hmm. and oh, he's issued a fatwa that calls for the authors of a constitution to be elected. Well, you know, we'll just get somebody else to write another fatwa. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, in the early days, it was a little tough to, to grasp the full nature of Sistani's clout, but there were people there who were saying, we should listen to this man. Right. and. Uh, the, 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 the people in the palace didn't listen carefully enough. Speaking of clout and people who should have been listened to, I, here's one of the things that really struck me, Rajiv, and I, I guess I kind of um, felt it as a, as a kind of an emerging uh, uh, subterranean issue in this book. Jer Sir Jeremy Greenstock, I believe he was the, mm -hmm. the British ambassador, I didn't see him consulted at all by Bremer, except for one dressing down he got, a criticism. And I began to wonder what was the role that in a coalition, you would yeah. expect some degree of... You would. And, and Sir Jeremy Greenstock is, is one of Britain's most eminent statesmen, a former uh, British ambassador to the United Nations. He, uh, of course, was uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair's chief envoy in Iraq. Mm -hmm. He was really cut out of the process. Completely he doesn't relegate. Yeah. Uh, tell you tell you an interesting story. When President Bush made that surprise visit to Baghdad's airport on Thanksgiving Day 2003, right. Nobody in Bremer's office told Sir Jeremy Greenstock or invited him to the airport, even though Greenstock occupied an office directly across from Bremer's. Sir Jeremy learned about it when one of his staffers came into his office and said, Sir, you may want to turn on the television. The American president is at the airport. Uh, you know, that to me is so indicative of the role that the British played. And the, the British sent quite a good number of very talented diplomats from their foreign and commonwealth office, people who spoke Arabic, who had experience in that part of the world, but they were kept at arm's length. It was not a true coalition. Doesn't sound it at all. Here's another mystery for me uh, that's implicit in this book. Where was Congress in all this, Rajiv? I mean, of course, they were asked for money. At one point, there's a request for, I think, $20 billion supplemental that's very key. but. There seems to be, and because throughout this book there, there are issues of missing money, mm -hmm. uh, mismanagement, uh, but I didn't see any sense of oversight or anyone writing heard from the congressional interview. Congress was completely checked out. They were hoodwinked or they were either sort of willfully blind. Mm -hmm. Plenty of congressmen showed up in Baghdad for what they called CODELs, congressional delegation right. trips. But these things were one-day trips that fly in in the morning, they'd leave in the evening. Mm -hmm. They were largely confined to the green zone. Mm -hmm. uh, they would, you know, go have the obligatory meal with some home state troops. Mm -hmm. They'd sit around in the palace, they'd hear briefings from Americans. They might go for one trip outside the green zone, mm -hmm. but they never really saw the country. They didn't spend nights there. They didn't travel around extensively. Um, Bremer, Bremer was very good at managing Congress and showing mm -hmm. visiting congressmen just what they wanted to see. Right. Um, it, but uh, you know, Congress has an oversight role, and, and members of Congress should have balked at this and should have insisted on, on being able to travel more, see more, uh, but they didn't. One aspect of that could have been, though, to give them uh, some um, understanding, perhaps, in their, in their uh, lack of oversight, was there also a little whistleblowing, at least until the end. I didn't get the sense that, that people were speaking out until it was the, the transition had taken place about what had gone wrong. Because the place was packed with loyalists and there were very strict rules. Mm -hmm. Journalists, for instance, could not go and troll the halls of the palace without an escort from the press office. Mm -hmm. uh, people who worked in the palace were told that they were not to speak to journalists, for instance, without official permission. Um, and so it was very draconian. People mm -hmm. felt that they, they could have been packed up and sent back on the next flight out of Baghdad right. if they violated those rules. It was, in many ways, a transplantation of the same rules that the White House uses here mm -hmm. in Baghdad. So it was really tough as, as a journalist there to, to, to understand what was happening. And it wasn't until the Coalition Provisional Authority was dissolved in the summer of 2004, mm -hmm. many of those people came back to the States, they began to look at Iraq from afar and began to see really the consequences of mm -hmm. what they had done and, and, and began to see that things weren't turning right. out the way they had hoped 
many of them became a little disillusioned and they became more willing to talk to people well, to, like myself. To cite one example, there's John Agresto, yes. a well-known American educator who's yes. sent over there to help the uh, quite large or vast uh, Iraqi university system and is completely, uh, his work is completely futile. Does he speak out after he comes back? Though? He was one of the few who spoke out right before he was going to leave. And mm -hmm. Agresto is a very interesting story. He he ran St. John's College, a 500 student uh, college in uh, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. He was sent out there to run Iraq's university system, which has 375,000 students. I mean, a huge difference. But he had connections. He was he had worked with Lynn Cheney at the National Endowment for the Humanities, Joyce Rumsfeld, Secretary Don Rumsfeld's wife was on his board of directors. Um, when he went out there, though, he went out with, with good intentions and, and a real desire to fix things and wound up getting stymied at every turn. The U.S. Agency for International Development gave him something like, you know, $8 million to fix up Iraq schools. We we're talking a series of campuses that were devastated by right. looting. He, 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 predict, he estimated that they needed several billion dollars. Well, he got nothing. He well, couldn't travel around. And finally, before he left, mm -hmm. he famously told me he felt like a neoconservative who'd been mugged by reality. I love that quote in the book. Of course, it's, I think it, it, it's also true, though, that, uh, that $8 million, a paltry sum, it was largely to be spent in this country with universities, right? Uh, the, the oh, yeah, that, that, was, that was a slightly different program, yes. Right. I mean, and, 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 and just absolutely amazing to me that the first sum of money was $25 million. I, I should correct that. Uh, but instead of giving that directly to Iraqi schools... Mm -hmm. They went to schools here. Exactly, to partner with Iraqi schools. That were non-existent and, and were non-functioning. And some of these were completely absurd. Mm -hmm. You know, the University of Hawaii's Tropical Agriculture Department was chosen to partner with the University of Mosul's College of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Not only is Mosul a subalpine climate, so far from tropical, the, the School of Agriculture in Mosul was burned to the ground by looters. Mm -hmm. There was nobody to partner with. So that was the first $25 million that literally went down the toilet. Um, then the, the, the next $8 million that came from the congressionally uh, uh, approved supplemental budget request, that was, was he got $8 million and that was to, to, to repair all of Iraq's schools, which he, he estimated needed more than a billion dollars. Well, the whole thing is an exercise in irreality, unreality, surrealism, and, and much else besides. But perhaps also this, Rajib, as we near the end of our conversation, perhaps it's also a lesson for us about our own understanding of democracy. I mean, first of all, I mean, I took from this that maybe we have to learn about what the preconditions for democracy really are. You know, as Agresto told me before he left, you know, we Americans think that bringing democracy to other countries is easy. You know, we've had democracy in our country for so long that we've just become accustomed to it. And we, we think it's the natural order. Mm -hmm. But really, for democratizing a country, it's hard work. And it's not simply just saying, here, you can have elections. It involves the building of civil society, of institutions, of, of creating political alliances and, and, and the development of, of parties and, and, and trusted leaders. And all of that, that takes a lot of work. Right. And it requires security. It requires a degree of infrastructure. And Iraq didn't have those things. A and we, uh, as John Agresto tells me, and as I eventually came to conclude too, we just tried to sort of bite off a lot more than we could chew right away. And, and we needed to be, in my view, more modest right. and, and view this in a more incremental way and bring positive change, but not try to do it all in one fell swoop. Sounds like the kind of thing that can either be imposed nor imported wholesale, but has to, one can help the process if one allows the people there to begin it? There has to be a process that's organic. Mm -hmm. It has to also come from the ground up. Mm -hmm. What about your sense, and I've heard my British friends mention this with some degree of um, perhaps caustic delight, that this country lacks a, uh, lacking a, an imperial history of its own, uh, no colonial service, was ill-equipped to even think of there being an emerald city and an empire and running it effectively, that we're just not the kind of thing we do well. Oh, you know, I don't accept the proposition that we don't have nation-building talent in the United States. Mm -hmm. I think we have plenty of people. They work for the State Department. They're Americans who work for UN agencies. They work for non-governmental organizations. But those people, the best and the brightest, were turned away or were not mm -hmm. asked 
to participate. And instead, we turned, in many cases, to the loyal and the willing, people who didn't have this expertise, who were brought out there. And so I think that if we had actually assembled the right group of people, mm -hmm. we could be seeing a different outcome. I don't think we'd, we'd have a very, you know, that Iraq would be totally peaceful. There would still be an insurgency driven by zealots who saw no room for compromise. But I think we could have created a palpably different environment had the staffing been different. In the current circumstances, do you retain any hope that that can still be accomplished? I think, you know, it's a little too late. I think that we're now, we now have a good team of people out there, a very professional ambassador, a good team of diplomats. There's reconstruction money. There, there are troops focusing in on the security situation in Baghdad. There's an Iraqi government that's been stood up. But these are steps that have been taken months, in some cases years, too late. We needed mm. to do a lot of this stuff sooner. What you're telling me, and, and I think very, very profoundly, Rajiv, is that the mistakes of the coalition provisional authority some years ago, a few years ago, uh, are still haunt us. And, they, and they're complicating the mission of the, the military today. Exactly. I, mean, I view my book as, 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 as a tale of the other fiasco. You know, we know about the, the devastating consequences of the failure to send enough troops to stabilize Iraq, the failure by the Pentagon to anticipate the growth of the insurgency. But there's a whole other world of failures here, and those were committed by the civilians who went there to reconstruct and govern Iraq. And their missteps, in my view, in many ways, are just as responsible for the mess that we find ourselves in there today. Rajiv, I think you've been telling us a story we need to hear. It's a gripping book, by the way. It reads, I know this is a kind of a phrase one hears um, um, often, but it's meant here sincerely, novelistically. I mean, there's a kind of a page-turning quality to this story, which I think uh, uh, makes it very accessible to every reader. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHC Worldview channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. And please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching. And thank you for talking, Rajiv. Thank you. Next week on Dialogue... Some women were kidnapped. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some were cheated, basically saying there is a good job out there. Come as nurse. They actually, some women were giving treat, uh, training for nurses to cheat, you know, middlemen. Uh, and they were basically sold to Japanese. And they had them as sex slaves trafficked across the country. That's a major trafficking. You know, now we are talking about tra female trafficking. That was the worst form of That's trafficking. Right. That's right. And Koreans, North and South Koreans, Japanese, mm -hmm. Vietnamese, Singaporeans, Burmese, you name it. You name it. They were Everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. Anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm.